The death rate for endometrial cancer is on the rise, and there's therefore an urgent need for improved clinical care. My name is uh, Christian Mart. I'm a gynecologist from the Medical University in Innsbruck in Austria. And today we will summarize the current treatment landscape in advanced endometrial carcinoma and discuss how to optimize treatment selection. Despite the high five-year survival rate of over 80% endometrial cancer, there is a major disparity in survival rates between localized, regional, and distant metastasis. And for over a decade, advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer treatment was reliant on carboplatin and bacrituxal as recommended, for example, by the ESMO guideline 2022. However, more recently, the molecular tumor characterization has led to the development of new targeted therapies, particularly immunotherapies tailored to molecular subtypes. And for this, I would like to discuss now today a patient case, Jane. She was diagnosed in 2021 with an endometrial cancer, FIGO stage 1b, endometrioid adenocarcinoma, grade 2, no lymphovascular space invasion, L1 CAM positive, and no lymph node metastasis. We did an upfront surgery with a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-fractomy. And because of the high risk factors, we decided to give an adjuvant chemotherapy, carboplatin paclitaxel. Unfortunately, the patient progressed three years later and developed metastasis in liver and lung. We did a core needle biopsy, and this revealed a grade three endometrial carcinoma. And unfortunately, at the beginning, we didn't have a molecular classification. And this is clear the clinical dilemma. Without a detailed molecular classification, an effective treatment plans remain challenging, underscoring the importance of molecular profiling. So we need nowadays that we have at least four different types of endometrial carcinoma. On one side, we have the mismatch repair deficient tumor. We have the pol E mutated tumor, the P53 abnormal, and the no specific molecular profile, the NSMP. These subtypes are determined through immunohistochemistry stains and for the pol E, a sequencing of the exonuclease domain. It is important to understand that the pol E mute have a hypermutated tumors and with a very good prognosis, they don't need to get an adjuvant therapy. We have the mismatch repair deficient tumors with maybe a limited chemotherapy effect, but the high responses to immunotherapy. We have the NSMT tumors, mainly low-grade endometriot. Those tumors may have a benefit from hormonal therapy. And then we have the P53 abnormal especially serious high-grade endometrial tumors with a poor prognosis, which need an intensive therapy. And indeed, in James immunohistochemistry, we found a mismatch repair proficient status, but P53 abnormal tumor. And based on this information, which treatment options are nowadays available? We know from several trials that the addition of immunotherapy to the standard of care, carboplatin, paclitaxel, improves progression-free survival. We have the RUBY trial with dostalimab, improving the progression-free survival from 19% to 28% after two years with a hazard ratio of 0.76. Also the energy, energy derived 18, also improved progression-free survival by the addition of bembolizumab with a hazard ratio of 0.54. But not all immuno agents work in the same efficacy. We saw the ATTEMPT trial with no difference. On the other hand, more recently, the addition of PARP inhibitors have improved, especially in the mismatch repair proficient, the progression-free survival. The duo E trial in the combination of duovalumab and olaparib showed a benefit 
in the mismatch repair proficient group, and this resulted also in an approval. Very similar results have also been obtained by the RUBY trial with Tostalimab and Nirabarib. However, there is also another option. We know that the combination of lenvatinib and pembrolizumab has shown an improved progression-free survival and overall survival in PMMR subgroups in the second-line setting. And this was also translated now in the first-line setting in the LEAP-01 trial. This trial was in the intention to treat population negative. However, in the subgroup of, for those patients treated with neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy, a major improvement in progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0.6 and also an improvement in overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.67. So the median progression-free survival was increased from eight months to almost 13 months. And also overall survival was increased by more than a year. It is critical to help patients to understand their molecular subtype and its influence on treatment options. Nowadays, providing a simplified explanation of the molecular characteristics and their impact on treatment selection can empower patients to make informed decisions and build trust in medical teams' recommendations. This is essential to discuss especially potential side effects of these new treatments particularly with chemotherapy option such chemo plus checkpoint plus uh, PARP inhibitor, or also in the combination of lenvatinib and pembrolizumab. This transparency ensures patients can weigh the pros and cons and remain committed to their treatment plan and engage in shared decision-making. 